Well, praise the Lord. Good evening. Good night. Uh, happy. Merry Christmas. <laughs> yes, it's quite a shock for my system. And I think the only two people who didn't get the memo was myself and the Canadian geese who came home. I was looking at them uh, from the hotel room down by the water, and they looked very confused. And I thought, yep, you're a, you're a week early or so, but then again. Um, good to see all of you. Wow. Uh, on a snowy, wintry, slushy Saskatchewan night. You're in the right place at the right time for the right reason. Yes. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm, I want to share the word with you tonight. And I'm kind of an in-your-face type of a preacher. And so sometimes when your face is so far away, it makes me walk further because then I can't really get in your face all that way. So if you morph over to this side, I can feel your face a little bit better. Then they don't watch me as I get all the way over there. It's just kind of how my feet go by themselves, you know. But just, just let you know I love you even as you're doing that. Uh, um, I wanted to just uh, give you a glimpse um, of, of kind of my, me, my ministry. And it's, it's going to come up in a video. They're going to show it to you. Uh, I love showing this one because it kind of shows you a, the many different little types of versions of me. And then I'm getting right into the word. So we'll see what, which version Holy Spirit pulls out tonight. So if you've got that, let's just show them a little bit of who I am. And then I want you to open your heart for the word tonight. All right. Father, we ask you, Lord, move in our lives tonight. Break every chain. Sovereign God, we are yours. We thank you, God, that you are ours. You're our God. Tonight, my Lord, we submit our lives to you. We want the power of your Holy Spirit to saturate our lives. We don't even know how. We don't even know what to do at times, but we surrender and we say, God, have your way. Have your way. So almighty God, as your vessel, use me. And as your children, speak to us. We receive from your throne room. And we say, Lord, yea and amen to all that you want in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? And I'm going to read tonight from Genesis chapter 28. And I'm reading verse 10 to 22, Genesis chapter 28. I'll read from the NIV. Starting at verse 10, I'm jumping into a story. And Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of, the, of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out the west, the east, the north, the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from the sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city was used to be called Luz. Verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone I've set up as a pillar will be God's house and all and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. 
Father, thank you for the word. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. I want to just share with you tonight a very, a very, a very simple, basic message that I'm so excited that God put in my spirit for here because of the season you're in, coming out of 40 days of fasting and prayer and consecration. Last night I preached on shift. And was there anyone here last night? Okay. So you remember what we're doing, right? We, we're, what are we doing? Show the others because they weren't here. Come on, those of you who are here, get up quickly. Don't waste my time. we got to run Saturday night. Come on, jump up if you were here last night. So what are we doing? We what? Come on now, talk to me. We're what? Clutch. And then you shift. And what are you doing? You're moving it from one gear. And if you're in a high gear, what are you going to do? You're going to shift and, uh, sorry, clutch and? Double clutch. Where were you? These ones, they don't even know about double clutch, and you, you messed up. You failed me. You failed me. So, uh, so all of you drivers who know how to do a good double clutch, we, we, we learned last night that this is a season to get ready to double clutch. We don't have time to waste time on this road of life. We're going to have to take it up gear after gear. And, and I want to take you now to another level, and my message is this. Establish simple altars. Establish simple altars. I just read the text, Genesis 28, and I'm going to refer to it in a bit. But here's this. Once you say altar, people freeze like, an altar. She's going to want an altar. She must be an old-fashioned preacher. She's starting with altar on a Saturday night when we're so contemporized, and she went to the altar word. First of all, if you call me old-fashioned and old preacher, I will slap you to meet Jesus right now. Okay? You'll be the first one to see Jesus tonight. The The significance of the altar is this. The altar is a conscious place where we reverently present ourselves before God. It is a conscious place where we reverently, R-E-V-E-R-E-N-T-L-Y, present ourselves before God. The altar, it's a conscious place where men meet with God and where God meets with man. And so when, you, when we read in ver- verse 28, it said that Jacob was lying on a stone and he was sleeping. And I'm going to pick up his story a little bit later in the message. But he was sleeping on a stone. And when he had this dream and he saw angels ascending and descending. Earth touching heaven. Heaven touching earth. Earth ascending the prayers, the cry, the plea, the petition. Everything going up to God and God's blessing coming down to earth. The altar is a conscious place where man meets God and God meets man. Now many times when we come to that that conscious altar, we're we're in a state where it's it's a one-way thing. Hey God, I got some more requests to send up to you. And he's up there going, yeah, I got some things to send down to you too. But you see, we've made it a one-way thing, and it's like jack in the box. And an altar is a conscious place where if I'm going to meet with you, means I want to talk to you. I want to commune with you. I want to have a moment with you. I want to have time with you. I want to have experience with you. And that's what it's about. And that's what we've got to come back to that place where we establish divine communication with our God. And that is both personal and corporate. It's both um, singularly and plural. It is for family as well as for single. Doesn't matter. We all need to come back to that place. We're at a time in our Christian journey where we must establish these true, I call them true altars, and they can be initiated anywhere and everywhere. It's where consciously, where our faith is stirred, and even subconsciously, where our excitement begins to grow. Do you know there's a lot of people who love Jesus, but they're not excited? I don't know how you can be serving Jesus and not be excited. I actually have a problem with sour-faced Christians. I, I, I can't handle it. Like, how do you represent Jesus Christ? How do you represent God, who is a God of humor? I mean, look at what he made. Like, look at you. You know, 
I mean, he's a god of humor. And, and then you meet these Christians like, I'm a Christian. Like, really? Really? Don't say the word. Don't say the word. Like, you know, freeze frame. Don't say it. Because if you're serving Christ, you know, everything about God is so exciting. Life is exciting. Uh, his gifts, his goodness, his grace, his mercy. Even when we mess up, it's so exciting to see how he helps us. Uh, and, and, and then you, you're like, you know, you ever meet these Christians? How are you doing? I'm making it. Oh, dear Lord. Do you know, I, I've always wondered, I said to people, why would a drunk man ever want to give up his bottle and come to some places called church? Like if you're drunk and you've been, you've been inebriated and then you come in and there's all these people going, bless the Lord. You're linking, I think I need to have some more scotch. You know, if, if you, but, but, but when you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior and know what he'll do for you, nobody got to put, no, nobody put nothing in this. This is all him. You know, you got to have the joy. What does the Bible say? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Some of you are wondering, is she for real? I've been this real all of my life and it ain't stopped. And it, it's not going to stop, okay? So don't, don't do the questioning. She couldn't be real. Yes, I am real. That's, that's, just, that's just my New Yorkin now, although I'm from Toronto. But here's the deal, friends. I, here's the deal. Consciously, my faith must be stirred when I'm meeting with God. And excitement should grow. And that means that everything in my life, I need to take it to an altar. I need to take it to his altar. Remember I said it's a conscious place. I didn't say it was a preset place. I didn't say it is just here or there. I said it's a conscious meeting place with God where I bring my wrongdoings, where I repent, where I purposely repent, where I say, God, I have sinned and I have failed you. Do you know the other issue? We don't even want to accept and acknowledge when we've sinned. Like, I know I messed up, but I'm okay with me. If I'm okay with me, then God's okay with me. I'm sorry, what theology is that? That's in the book of what? You know, I'm not sure what book that is, but give me a name. You know, name, scripture, and verse. Because when I've sinned and failed, you know, I serve such a mighty God who is so faithful and forgiving, but I need to acknowledge I messed up, God. I failed you. And I'll, can I tell you, there's no one who's perfect. The day you find a perfect Christian, do them a favor, express pass to heaven because they'll mess up tomorrow. We, none of us are perfect, but every day, every time, when we know we failed him, come back to God, make an altar and say, God, forgive me, I messed up. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to be this way. Speak to me, God. Don't let the lines break down. I need the communication lines to stay intact so you and I are always in touch with each other. Heaven coming down to earth and my cry going back up to heaven. God, bring me back to that place. Can I tell you tonight, that's what I want from every one of us? Because there's some stuff, stuff, there's some stuff that we haven't dealt with. And let me tell you, if you have stuff you don't deal with, after a while, the stuff starts to smell. Stuff, you know, if you don't, you know, there's, there's a little stink in everybody's life, but you don't have to keep it that way. Is that, can I share that with Saturday night? I would clean it up for Sunday morning, but you're, sad, you're the Saturday night crowd. I'm allowed to be a little bit more, you know? So he, <laughs> help them, Jesus. <laughs> Here's the deal, friends. Revival is what we want. Revival will come when repentance is coupled with submission to God. People sometimes like, I, I, I'm... I'm okay with myself and God is okay with me. Let's get back to the word. When we begin to repent, people outside will repent. If in the house of the Lord we do not repent, why would someone outside be repenting? And you know what revival is? Revival is not the oozy goozy bubbly feeling. Revival is when repentance is happening and people outside, people who don't know the Lord decide, I too need to repent of what I've been doing.
doing wrong and come to God as my Savior. Revival is when people are coming to the Lord in droves and they will come because the house of the Lord is found as A, a place of love, but B, a place where we bring our sins before a mighty and forgiving God and he brings us into a new life. Friends, can I tell you tonight, we are going to get to the place where we're going to have to build some altars tonight, starting tonight, but I don't want you to have a one-night shot. This is a message for the entirety of your life and even for the generations you are raising. Build, establish some altars because God honors simple altars. God honors simple altars. I'm going to share some examples with you. Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. These are some examples of simple altars. There's actually 360, I have the number further down, about 368, I think, references to establishing altars in the Bible. Here's, I'm just going to share a few of them with you. In Genesis 8.20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. So, so here's this, the first one I want to share with you. Remember I said an altar is a, is a conscious place where you establish, God, I am having divine, true, honest, earnest, heartfelt uh, 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 communication with you reverently, not, hey, God, what's going on? You know, it's reverently because we serve a mighty God. Amen. So here's Noah. He's, he, he's been on, a, on, on an ark for 40 days, and now finally he sends out a, a bird. He sends out a dove, and that dove doesn't come back. And later he sends another. The next one comes back with a leaf, and that means to Noah that, that, that we've hit land. We can get out of this ark. And the Bible says when Noah got out of the ark, he built an altar to the Lord, taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds. He sacrificed burnt offerings onto it. This is an important part, part of the passage because here's what happened. Noah's in a boat for 40 days, okay? It's got everything on it. It's got, it's got every type of animal, name them, the ones you like and the ones you don't like. By the way, have you ever figured out why they even allowed something like the hyena on it? I would have thrown him over and let him just go with water. I, I, you know, I, there's a few animals I'm going to ask Noah about when I get to heaven. Like, you could have left that one off the ark. But he had them all because God has a reason for everybody. It's why he didn't leave any of us out. Somebody might not like us, but God loves us. Amen. Purpose for each one of our lives. So here's Noah. 40 days, 40 nights. M by the way, have you ever thought about Mrs. Noah? Any of you ever thought about Mrs. Noah? I preach a, another message about Mrs. Noah. So, but he, let me just ask you. Uh, Mr. Noah decided to bring every type of animal on the ark. Do you know who's doing the cleaning of the house? <laughs> and she's not a happy camper. When she's not happy, he's not happy. So 40 days later, the, the, they, they dock, and he, he, he says, you know what, God? Thank you for your protection. Because, you know, there was a couple of times the lion didn't look too happy. And he was on there, too. There's a couple of times when, you know, that big black bear was like, don't think I want to be with these other animals here. There's a couple of times he probably had to put out some animal fights. And he's like, God, but you protected me in the midst of everything. Not only that, God, you provided for us and you've given us new land to dock on. There comes times in our lives we need to get the everything that's going on. Put, just put it on pause for a minute and build an altar. Where? Anywhere you need to build it. Anytime you need to build it. Anyhow you need to build it. He steps out of the boat and he's like, I'm just going to have some sacrifice time before the Lord right now because he protected me and he provided for me. Can I talk to you tonight? Get your life in such a gear that whenever things are happening or not happening, you get out of your boat or out of your whatever your situation, even if it's messy, muddy, slimy, it doesn't matter what it is. Stop and build an altar and give God thanks because you're still alive. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
That's Noah's story. He says, I survived devastation. Any of you ever survived some disaster? You survived it? Do you know what? Sacrifice some time. Sacrifice some time. God, uh, don't, don't just, I made it. I made it. Do you know, survivors, they drive, they, they're, they're, survivors are kind of like boring people. Eh? They, 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 they drive you nuts. They make my second nerve just go raw. You know, when you've, when you've survived, you should move to become an overcomer. Man, that boat, it was floating for 40 days. There was nothing out there but water. When I looked out, all I saw was water. Oh, let me start with Saskatchewan. It was just snow, just snow everywhere. <laughs> but I looked at it, and I said, you're not going to do me in. God's with me, brought me to Saskatoon to preach. I'm going to preach tonight. Ain't got no boots, but I'm going to preach tonight. <laughs> See, an overcomer tells a story of victory. A survivor goes, they look for pity. I almost made it. And, and just when I was going to turn into the church, the snow was so much that I parked. A survivor is always looking for sympathy. Can I talk to you? If you're a child of God, don't look for people's sympathy. Let people hear your Victoria story. I survived disaster. I overcame the obstacle. It nearly killed me. But I ain't dead. Look at this. This ain't dead, is it? I'm still going. Let the devil be sorry that he tried to trip you up. Am I, am I talking to a church tonight? Some of you, the, the devil is so happy with you. He's like, I got him. Going to get him again next week. You need to let the devil go, you know what? I'm not even going to bother with this one. Because every time I try to mess him up, he comes out with this great grin and happy story of how he overcame. I don't want him to be like that. I want him to be groany and grimy. By the way, as an evangelist, I meet a lot of people like that on the road. You know, when they can't tell the pastor their story anymore, they come and tell me. And it's like, please don't tell me. Go tell God. You know, uh, and now if you've got a, a, if you've got a prayer line, I'm sorry, if you got a prayer request, I will pray. If you're going, I need help from God. If you're like, and I want you to know it's been 40 years that I've been going through this. And inside I'm going, Jesus, come now. Come now. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> when you build an altar, you begin to give God thanks you know what happened? You change and you begin to speak differently. What looked like it was disaster begins to look like an opportunity. What looks like it was going to ruin you begins to be your setup for what God is going to do next. Get ready in your life, whether it's devastation, disaster, destruction, whatever it is, I'm still going to stop and build an altar and say, look what the Lord has done. He still brought me through even in the midst of my pain I'm still able to say bless the Lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name <laughs> glory to God mm. a second one Genesis 12 verse 8 this is a story of Abraham <clears throat> the Bible says from there he went on toward the hills of Bethel and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. And he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This one I'll do very quickly because here's the deal. Here's what happened. The Bible says that God, in the beginning of this story, God called Abraham and said, Abraham, look, at go. I'm going to send you out into a land called Cana. And God gives him all these promises. He was from a pagan uh, family. His, his family line were pagans. Abraham did not know God. Now God comes to him and God calls him out. And Abraham's going out and he's pitching his tent. Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. And what does he do? He builds an altar and he begins to call on the name of the Lord. I love this part because you know what's happening here? God calls Abraham and Abraham's like, I have no sweet clue where I'm going. I don't know what I'm going to do. 
I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get there. I don't know how I'm going to make it when I get there. I don't have any family around me. But one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to stop for a minute, build an altar, and say, God, would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would you help me? Would you give me direction? I don't know which way to turn. Because the word of God says, you will hear a voice saying, this is the way to go. Walk in it. Many of us, we make decisions without building an altar. And then we come back and cry, I don't know what happened, and it's not working out. Before we go down the road, before you go to the west to, to Bethel or to the east to Ai, build an altar right in the middle and say, God, I just want to hear your voice, which says, this is the way to go. We're in a modern day where we're making a lot of decisions and blaming God for the problem. Instead of saying, God, before I make the decision, let me hear your voice. And he promises, I will speak to you. I will tell you why. Heaven touches earth. Earth touches heaven. God's voice now by the power of the Holy Spirit is already within us. It's not even like the Old Testament. It's now New Testament. He's in us. All he wants us to do is stop and ask him. And here's the deal. If you stop and ask him and he says, go west, brother, go west. When you go east, brother, go on east, it's not God's fault. Because prayer is not only speaking it, it's hearing him. A lot of us are afraid. Do you know why we're afraid to hear God? Because we've already made up our mind. But if you want to have God's best, don't have your mind made up. Let God show you the way to go. I, I, I share this story. This is funny for all the, the, the you know, young people single ladies, because remember, I'm young. <laughs> I remember just one great relationship I had, and I was like, God, I mean, I, I can boast. He was awesome. He was baseball player out of Florida. Everything had two homes, one in Chicago, one in Florida. I'm going, this is it, God, this is it. <laughs> I mean, come on, wouldn't you think this is it? <laughs> you know? And I remember when my intercessor said to me, you know what God's saying, don't you? And I'm like, no, I don't. No, I don't. Don't hear nothing. And she goes, you know what God's saying? I'm like, no, I don't. She goes, you know what God's saying? I'm like, yes, I do, but I just don't want to hear right now because it feels so good. You know, years later, I look back and I'm like, Jesus, you know he loves me. I mean, you might think he loves you, but I'm going to tell you news tonight. He loves me. Okay, me. Okay, in case you didn't know it, he loves me. And he loves you. And when a, when a God, like our God, loves you like he loves you, he wants you to listen, even when it hurts. When we build an altar, it means, God, I'm listening to you. I want to hear what you have to say, even when I don't like it. And then many of us, we're afraid to build the altar because we're like, I don't think I can hear from God. He's not going to speak to me. Um, do you have ears? Do you have a brain that's functional? And even if you didn't, you know, God speaks to those who are not even functional. Because, you know, they say, have you ever noticed someone in a coma? They say, if you speak to them, they can hear. How much more can we all hear the voice of the Spirit? He's deep inside of us. But what we have to do is when we hear that still small voice in our spirit, recognize this is heaven touching earth. God is so wonderful that he would speak to me even though I don't like what he's saying right now. He's got a plan and a purpose. Well, can I tell you, if I had made some decisions I had to make, I would not be here with you all tonight. I would be sitting on some beach in Miami, or I'd probably be in jail for somebody I killed. But I'm just going to tell you right now, it, 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 when, you, when, you, when you trust God to let his voice give you his direction, it doesn't matter what pain you feel will come with it, greater peace comes than you've ever known in your entire life. Build an altar when you don't know which way to go or what to do. 
build it anywhere, anywhere, anyhow, anytime, but just have a conscious time where you say, God, I'm not moving until I hear from you. And he in heaven says, I'm right here. I've got your number. I've got your answer. Can I hear an amen tonight? Do you know the problems with evangelists? They love to preach. Mm. I'm going to skip this one because I shared a bit last night. Here's a third story I want to share with you. I love this one. Genesis chapter 28, verse 19 to 22. I'm just going to read a bit of this one. What's my message tonight? What's the title of my message? Can't hear you. Thank you. Establish a simple altar. Build an altar. I just want to know that you're hearing me. Because if not, I can preach till midnight. I preach in Africa. I can preach till midnight. You know, we, 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 can, we can go through the snowstorm, wait it out. It'll be melted when I'm finished. <clears throat> Praise God. Genesis 28, verse 19 to 22. He called the place Bethel. Though the city was called Luz, and Jacob made a vow saying, if God be with me, watch over me on this journey I'm taking. Give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God. This is, this is a story. This is out of the long text that I read. And here's what happened. Jacob was in trouble. Jacob was in trouble, and Jacob is now praying this prayer, and he's going, God, help me return safely to my father's house. So let me tell you what he did before you, you, you feel sympathy for him. We're going to feel sympathy, but hear the background. Jacob stole his brother's birthright. He stole Everything that was valuable from his brother Esau. He, the birthright, you've, I'm sure if you haven't heard that message, read the entire passage. I don't want to get into it. But he stole, it's like stealing a man's, like, oh, well, here is a good one. It's as if your grandfather left you a million dollars and your brother, steal wouldn't, would be a nice way of saying it, teeth it. That sounds stronger, doesn't it? When they teeth it, you ever hear somebody say, any Germans here, diff, you know, or, okay, so, you, 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 whatever other language you have, you know, I, I can give it to you, I'm Afrikaans or something, you know. Uh, here's the thing, he, his father's, the father's inheritance was for Esau, Jacob steals it, and he runs away, and he goes and he hides out at his uncle Laban. Now his father's dying and he's got to go back. And now he's got to meet his brother Esau. And he is so nervous because he knows what he did was wrong. And it was years ago. Now he has family. He's got tons of kids and wives and he's wealthy. But even though he's got all this stuff, he's still got to face his brother. And because he's done wrong, he's now coming across the, the he has sent his family across the river his brother's on the way and nerves has gotten the better of him and the bible says he put a stone and he lay down on the stone to sleep when you're a wealthy man and you're sleeping on a stone you have no peace because you see when you've wronged people or when things are, have not been good in our lives it, 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 it's it's a it's a hard sleep you know, the stone was, it represented a hard night. It's a, it's a, it's a peace, it's, a, it's not a peaceful night, it's a peaceless night. And so here's Jacob sleeping on a stone. And, but deep in his heart is a cry, God, help me. God, what am I going to do? And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord showed up and began to climb up a ladder and descend up and down the ladder. This Genesis 28 passage is powerful because, you know, it's almost close to the John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's the forgiveness of God. Jacob, you stole from your brother, and now you're crying and belly aching like a sissy. Oh, God, help me to get there safely to my father's house, and I promise, God, I'll give you money. God's like, I don't need your tenth. I need your repentance. But here's the deal, friends. Here's the deal. 
when we actively confess our sins, doesn't matter what that sin is, God is faithful to forgive. Don't you just love it? He's going to meet his brother. He was wicked to his brother. He stole everything for his brother. And God still shows up, sends the angels to minister to him in the midst. If I were God, and if you were God, we'd say, yeah, well, you deserve it. You wait till your brother shows up. You think you've got money? He going to cut you off. You know, we would have all the attitude, head swinging, shoulder moving, you know, and we'd be, you know, if you're not like my type of personality, then you're a calm quiet personality you'd go over to somebody and you do it differently you go isn't it just right that Jacob gets what he deserves you know it, it doesn't matter how you do it we would we, we would be so happy to see him get what he deserves can I tell you what I love about God we don't get what we deserve we get what he paid for what he died for aren't you excited tonight and so the Bible tells us Jacob, he says, God, the stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. Why? Because God had showed up in that night of his pain, his despair, and in all the, that he was going through, he was wrong. God didn't show up and go, Jacob, you were wrong. I'm going to judge you. God showed up and said, Jacob, I'm here with you. Can I tell you, that's what the altar is all about. Even when you have wronged others, allow the Spirit of the Lord to show up because you've made a conscious decision. I am going to confess. We're living in a day where people don't confess sins, you know. It's like, we're too educated for that. I mean, good Lord. We have more, you know, degrees than a thermometer. Why would we have to confess that we've done something wrong? Can I tell you something? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we're going to see revival in this day, if you're going to see the next generation not become just wicked and devious and, and destructive people, we first as adults need to repent, repent, repent. When we've done wrong, repent. Let them see us repent. Let them hear us repent. Let them know, confess, repent, make amends. I, I'm a preacher, and when I've done wrong, I tell that I've done wrong. Sometimes I tell it right in the pulpit so that y'all know I'm not perfect. Because I'll tell you, I travel airports every day. There are times I could... I, I, Jesus, keep me near the cross when I'm going through. I'm coming with my heavy bags, and they start getting on my last nerve. Ma'am, would you please put that in the thing? And I'm thinking, it ain't going to fit in the thing. It never fit there last week or the, the 10 weeks before. Why does this, and usually a woman, why does this woman have to come persecute? And inside of me, the real flesh is coming up going, I'm going to hit her with this bag if she don't leave me alone. And then you got to, Jesus, keep me near the cross. And then I've got to go and make my repentance because a lot of times it says reverent on my ticket. You know, <clears throat> this is, this is, <laughs> it's, but here it keeps me humble. But here's the deal. What I say to you, I have to always keep guard. There's a lot of, the problem with us today is we don't feel we need to repent of anything. God, I don't have anything to repent of. I'm pretty good. And, and, I, and, and the better part is this, I'm better than him. See, our measurement is not the word of God. Our measurement is others. As long as I'm doing better than you, then God should be happy with me. Can I tell you, we're going to come back in the house of the Lord and in your own houses, in your workplace, in your bathroom. I don't care. If you've done something to your spouse and, and you, you don't know what to do, go in the bathroom, flush the toilet, and cry out, oh, God, I was wrong, I was wrong, flush, flush. I was wrong, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done it. God, forgive me. And, and, and let the peace of God come over you so you can come out and take care of it and we can restore our joy our homes, our lives. Can I talk to the Saturday night church? It's time for true repentance. We've been bound up, bent up, and pent up. It's time to release these things to God because he knows what they are and we're living in the bondage to them. When Jacob spent the time before God, crying out from the depths of his heart, God showed up. And when God showed up, everything was made right. That's what my heart cries for you tonight. Amen. Amen. Can you receive that? Amen. Oh, I just noticed. I just noticed he's taping. Poor guy. 
Here's what Jacob said, I've sinned against God and man, but God still forgives. Make an altar. And you know, I gotta just share this quick part. Jacob made the altar, God showed up, and he take, took the stone and he made it a lasting memory so he would always remember the time when God had restored him and healed him. But just because we repent of everything doesn't mean there won't be consequences. Jacob had to suffer some consequences along the way. And when we've got to suffer consequences, don't blame God. Just say, Lord, you have made, you've given me my cup, and you will give it to me in pleasant places. That's what David says. Now, Lord, help me to take whatever consequence it is, live beyond it, live above it, live through it, and let people see that the glory of the Lord is still upon my life. Amen? Glory to God. So here, here's the deal, friends. The altar was used by many biblical characters. I won't go through all of them. And the altar is not just here at the church. The altar is a conscious place wherever you make it, whenever you make it. What I love about this altar, we call this an altar. It is a corporate place, but it's a personal place. Can I ask some of you, start coming in the before the service, after the service, even during the service. You know, if the Spirit of the Lord moves upon you and you feel to come and kneel down, as long as it's the Spirit of the Lord on you, you will never interrupt the message. If it's not the Spirit of the Lord, then maybe there'll be some problem. But if it's the Spirit of the Lord, you know, because God's Spirit does not contradict itself. Uh, make this is one type of altar. Make this a place where you begin practicing coming in and saying, God, I got to repent of some things. I've been acting like I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips, but I got some things to take care of. Make an altar at home. Make an altar wherever you are. This is a place where you don't just come when you've got problems. You come when you have thanksgiving. You know why we don't, we don't see any miracles? We're only coming when there's an issue. Come when you've got something to thank God for. Come when you need direction. Come when you're happy. Come when your, your, your belly is busting with joy. Come then. Because when you come and say, bless God, I got my job, somebody else will get their miracle because you built an altar before them. We've made this a place to come when you're sick and when you're dying and when, every, when you, you look like you're going to be having to be dragged out. That's not what the altar is about. The altar is a conscious place where we meet God in good times, in bad times, in happy times, in sad times. If we stop giving glory to God in the good times, then we no, do not understand the Lord whom we serve. Oh, glory to God. <clears throat> I ran out of breath. <laughs> Pastor, how do you preach here every week? Bar pa pause, don't film that. Do you know how dry it is? <laughs> and is it just me? I keep asking. Can you not pour water out from the <laughs> ceiling or something? Let it feel dew from heaven? I've, I've got to hurry. One of the reasons, friends, why we see so many revivals in the third world countries where they're oppressed is that the more oppressed they are, the more they give thanks. The tougher it is, the more they give glory to God. Today we have more stuff imaginable and less power and less answers, but God is still wanting to do his miracles. The altar is a place of prayer, request, petition, surrender, restoration, adoration, sacrifice. It is a place where we come and we consciously meet with God and we say, Lord, let your outpoured presence be upon my life. Let my faith increase and let my passion come back. If you don't have passion for God, this is where you come and you go, I don't feel anything. It's not the message why you don't feel anything. It's something in your own heart. Well, it's because some some preachers are not as exciting. No, it's your own spirit that's not excited. Because if the preacher is boring and your spirit is happy, guess what? You will think it's the best message since sliced bread because you're already full of joy in the Holy Ghost. Because the word is always alive and active. If you don't have passion serving God, why? Why 
Why do you not have passion? Make an altar and say, God, give me back my fire. When I came to serve you, I had fire. I had joy. I mean, I was dangerous. I was extremely dangerous. Now I'm just like a wuss, like a little sissy. Father, put back passion in my spirit because I cannot be a dried up Christian reflecting the glory of the Lord. Build an altar. An altar is a place of divine communication where God does not give you grades for your prayer life. He doesn't give you grades. Are you excellent? Can you come and thou, God of heaven, almighty one. It's just a place of divine communication where you open your blab and use it. And where he, as divine, as almighty, and as sovereign as he is, he listens to your blab. And then he speaks softly, sweetly, divinely into your spirit, letting you know, I got you. I'm with you. And guess what? You're going to make it. It's not just for the bad times. It's for the good times. And I want to see the church. How, how do I know revival is coming? Because this church has been in prayer, consecration. You're doing everything right. But now my job in the, as an evangelist is to say, do the spiritual things too. If you start giving praise to God, let, let people be jealous of your joy. Let people be excited that you have so much to give thanks for that they seek out something to give thanks for. Let, don't let it be that this place or your home, let your children see you giving glory to God for everything. I want it to start here tonight, but it's not going to stop here. They need to see who you are, know who you are. They need to understand that you are a praying person. You're a, you're a person who communicates with God. They can't just think, oh, mommy and daddy so wise. Oh, mommy and daddy so sad. They need to know you take it to the Lord always in prayer and you have his answers to walk with. And when you don't hear the answer right away, the Bible says if you ask and you didn't hear, seek. What does seek mean? You look. And if you didn't get it, what do you do? You get ugly. It says it in another translation, my own. Get ugly. Knock. How do you knock? When you're, ah, God, like open your mouth, blab, get some Kleenex, snot, do it all. <clears throat> we become too beautiful. Where's my musicians? Come help me. You get to pick. Here's the deal. We're going to have conscious altar time. And I never know what I'm doing with altars. I don't plan them. I don't manipulate them. I don't even duplicate them. I never do. I, I, I just don't. I wait till the Lord puts it in my spirit. So here's what we're going to do tonight. I don't know how many of you are here, and I have to pick it. How many of you, you've got something to thank God for? Let me see your hands. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. How many of you, you need direction? You don't know what to do, and you need direction. Thank you. How many of you, God has provided so much for you that you need to just shout out, God, you've been too good to me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, like this is all this right here. This is this winter's hibernation, I call it. <laughs> healthy hibernation. I, I was praying the other day in a church. I said, God, thank you for healthy hibernation. <laughs> You know, we've been too hard on ourselves. Everything we're negative about, oh, I'm so fat. No, I'm healthy in hibernation this summer. It means I've been having a good year. <laughs> Give God thanks for some things. How many of you, you're stressed and you need to hear God's voice so peace comes back in your heart? Let me see your hands. How many of you, you're gonna, this is going to get tough now. How many of you, there's some things you got to repent of and you you, you, gotta re you just got to repent. You, you, you know that you've got it thought out, but you haven't really declared it out to God, but you're going to have to do it. Let me see. Here's the crazy thing. We think it, but we must act on it. 
God is so loving, so kind. An altar is a conscious place where man meets God and God meets man. We're going to start it here, but it's not just for here. It's for everywhere, every time. Because I want you to be walking in such power that devils are scared of you. I want demons to say, I ain't going around that crazy nut. Because they, they got all Holy Ghost stuff going on inside of them now. I, 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 I want some things that, that, that he's held. You know, you know what? Can I tell you something? There, if you have a secret, there's three people with your secret. You, God, and the devil. God wants to deliver you from the secret. The devil wants to keep you in the secret. So what do you do? Tell it to God. Oh, by the way, he already knows it. He just wants you to acknowledge that it's there so that the devil doesn't have a part of your life. Friends, we're going to have a conscious time tonight. Can you just, it's Saturday night. The kids will come in if they have to. If you got to run out and get the kids, you're going to bring them in and have altar time with them. We're going to practice here. Those of you that have kids, the poor workers, do not want you to say, oh, bless God, they're happy over there. They want you to come and bless God yourself. Uh, and so if you have to get your children, you do that, and you're going to have an altar time. Here's the deal. I, 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 I almost, I don't even know how I want to do this. I want to do it this way. If, if, if you have, if you have, if you, let's start with repentance, because see, repentance brings revival. If you've got some things in your life that you know, I have got to deal with these things. I have got to deal with these things, me and God. I want you to get up and go find a place, and I want you to open your mouth. Don't just squat there and go, read my mind, God. Read my mind. He's going, no, I can read your mind. I made it. Now open your big blab that I gave you and tell me about it. And then listen for my peace and my answer and my strength. Feel my strength. I want you to do that. If you have been, been blessed by God and you haven't given him thanks, I want you to watch. All of you, all of you blessed ones, here's what you're going to do. I, I, you're going to walk around the place like you're mad. You're going to say, devil, I didn't thank God enough, so I'm thank you, Jesus. Are you going to raise some of your hands that have been so tied to your waist that, that the poor thing is asking for help? You're going to raise it to heaven and thank God. God, look what you've done. For, look like you're happy. Some of you, you don't know what to do. You're, you're, you're struggling. You're, you, you need help. You, 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 God, I don't know where to go. I want you to find a place and kneel down and just talk to him calmly. God, I have to hear you. I'm a child of God. I'm not perfect, but no one is. So let me hear your voice telling me which way to go. I'm not going to stop asking until I hear you. And listen to him. I, I, I don't know, what, is it, what, what do you need to build an altar for? He protected you. He provided for you. He's blessed you. He's given you. He's healed you. He's, some of you, he, you need a healing. You need a miracle. You need a miracle. How many of you need a miracle of healing? Let me see your hands. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Those of you that need a healing touch, I want you to come right down here. I, I'm going to join you in your altar. You go make an altar right here so I'll know who you are. And then I'll, Pastor and I, I just sequestered him. You just make your own altar anywhere, anywhere. Don't, don't get churchy on me. Just, <laughs> just, you just start talking to God. And don't, don't let the devil condemn you and think they're letting you feel as if I, 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 there's a reason why I'm the one that's sick. There is no reason. It's just life. So here's the deal all over this place now. Those of you that need to repent of some things, just get up and go somewhere. Not, not right here, because I know what I'm doing here. Just spread out. Don't let anybody, here's the thing, when I say repentance, like, oh, but I don't want anybody, I don't care who sees. They tell them, you know, you know what, I wasn't born with you, I won't die with you, you know, whatever. You know, just, just make it happen. Guys, just give me something there. And those of you, you Thanksgiving people, you're going to walk around this place. You're going to bless, bless God I, I, audibly. I got to hear it. Okay, don't, don't be keeping your little mouth shut like you're so cute. Open your mouth. If you can't do it here, you won't do it in your house. 
I want to hear you. I want to hear the voices thanking God. But, I mean, Marie, after I say it once, what do I do? Say it again. Say it until your spirit goes crazy. Say it until the devil realizes that, ooh, she dangerous. He's gone mad. I don't care what you do, but I, 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 I'm big on stuff like this. I'm big on us building an altar, and I want you to spread out right now. Give glory. Open your mouth. Let me hear voices in this place. Let me hear voices give, declaring thanks to God.